Tandem Nomads, episode 36. Finding your passion is another very important one. You have to find out what it is you love to do. Because how else are you going to survive with moving from country to country, losing your clients, having to start again, being anonymous again, having to ask questions again, being lost again? How can you cope with that if you don't do something you love? Welcome to Tandem Nomads, where inspiring expat partners from around the world share with you how they turn the challenges of relocation into great opportunities. So are you following your partner abroad for his or her career? Then Tandem Nomads is the place for you. Go to tandemnomads.com and sign up for the newsletter. Hello, Nomad Nation. This is Emel Deregi, and today I'm very excited to introduce you to Joe Parfit. Joe, are you ready for the ride? I certainly am. Fantastic. Every Monday, I interview for you inspiring expat partners to share with you their story and how they managed to build their portable careers while living in a global nomadic tandem. Today, I really cannot think of a better example than Joe Parfit, who became an expert in building a portable career while moving with her husband and kids from France, Dubai, Oman, Norway, the Netherlands, and now Malaysia. She has become what I call a serial nomadpreneur. Joe is a journalist, editor, writer, speaker, and teacher who has launched multiple business ventures that include the publishing company called Summer Publishing. She also founded the Expat Bookshop, and an online bookstore, and Joe has written over 30 books herself. And one of her masterpieces is all about portable career. The book is called A Career in Your Suitcase. Joe, this was really a short and fast overview of who you are. <laughs> Tell me what I missed and is there what is happening in your life today? Well, the first thing is my company is called Summertime Publishing. Oh, sorry. Not, not summer. That's okay. Summertime. <laughs> Summertime Publishing. Okay. Uh, what's happening in my world today? Well, I live in Malaysia. I've been here for uh, nearly two and a half years with my husband on our first empty nest posting. Um, and until we came here, I had been running my business from where we were living and establishing my business there. We were in the Netherlands for about 10 years, and I established my business in the Netherlands and had a Dutch company there with Dutch tax and Dutch VAT and horrible things like that. And before that, I was in England for a few years, and I was running the business there. So it's always been established somewhere. However, when we came to Malaysia, I just thought, no, I'm not doing it again. I am not setting up a business in Malaysia at vast expense to then leave it again behind and have to undo it because it had taken such a huge amount of energy doing that in the Netherlands. But we were there for a long time, so it didn't matter so much. But here I knew we wouldn't be here more than four years, and I thought, I can't do it. So I established a proper business, a limited company, Summertime Publishing is Summertime Publishing Limited in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I file my accounts in the UK. So I did that this time. So it's the first time that I have had um, a business that has been established in a different country from the one in which I'm living. With all the holidays and all the visitors, it doesn't give me enough time to work as much as I did. And that's what's so great about my career in that I have adapted it so that it can be as much or as little as I want. So if I've got nothing to do, I can keep myself busy very easily. Um, with the business. If I've got visitors, I can manage to do much less. But the thing that I did that made the biggest difference was three years ago, I had three and a half actually, I had a burnout because I was a workaholic. Hmm. And sometimes that can be quite a difficult thing to cope with because I have always been a workaholic since I first started working. And I started actually, I ran my own business since I was 24. So I have very rarely worked for anybody else. Um, and, so, and I've been an expat since I was 26. Yeah. So I have been uh, running my own business all this time. Amazing. Very amazing. You've been talking of so many important topics in just a couple of minutes that I would like to go back and start with one of the things you mentioned about the great thing about having a portable. When Once we manage to have 
to build a portable business, the great thing about it, as you were saying now, you're so busy with your visitors, is also to be able to adapt it to your lifestyle. Yes. And and this is one of the great advantages of, of, of building portable businesses. And I know that there are, besides visitors, there's also family, you know, obligations and having kids. And so I guess being able to build a portable business as an expat and as a mother, as a parent in general is one of the best ways to be able to live the life we want while traveling around the world and still building our own independence and, and, and own success, professional success. Yeah. Yes, it's, it has been, it's been quite a learning. I, I mean, I have worked more than full time, but now I, I thought with an empty nest, that now I would have to work even harder. But I, I can't because I have far too many other things that I have to do. And, I, of course, I want to take advantage of living in Southeast Asia. I want to have people to visit and stay in our villa with a beautiful view and a beautiful pool I, and with five bedrooms that we don't need. So I want to, I want to have them here. Yeah. But the thing that I have done that has made the biggest difference, when I had this burnout, I needed help for the first time. I really needed help. I couldn't do all the things I was doing on my own. Now, back then, um, I was running my publishing company from the Netherlands. I was doing all the conversion of the Kindles, all the uploading of all the books, all the marketing, all the running of expat bookshop, all the blogging, all, all the getting in of the clients, all the helping of the clients, all the editing of the books, or everything. Mm-hmm. Not surprised I burnt out, to be honest. I mean, it's so a how, massive amount. Of how work. did you get so, out of it? How did you manage to... Well, I, one of my students called... She had, well, she had been a student on every course I'd ever run for a few years, and her name was Jane Dean. And she lived in... Well, she still does live in the Netherlands. And she rang me up as a friend and said, Are you okay? Do you want any help? And I said... Yes, <laughs> I can't cope. I can't even sit at my desk. Honestly, it was right at the beginning. I said, I can't sit at my desk. I can't even look at my emails. I've got to file my accounts. You have to do them every three months, every, um, every quarter in uh, the Netherlands. And it's just awful. You have to file your accounts. I said, I can't even do my accounts. And she said, oh, that's all right. I'm a trained accountant. But, oh, Thank you. So she came, and, and I was. We sat on the floor because I couldn't sit on my desk because I did. It was just too hard for me. And we sat on the floor, and she helped me go through my accounts. And while we were sitting there that day, I said, "Jane, do you want to work for me?" And um, she said she'd absolutely love to be an editor. So, and she's got an English degree, and she lives in has, has American citizenship. So she has lived in America, and so she is completely au fait with. English, um, British English and American English. And she's an avid reader. And she's a really good writer. And I thought, okay, let's give you a go. So she's, she's, she worked hard and she has become absolutely phenomenal. And that meant that I could pass a huge chunk of my business over to her. And Jane now not only does the majority of the editing, but she also... Um, runs the production side of things. So she really helps with the checking the manuscripts before they go off to press. So I ended up with a freelance who's also an expat partner, also living abroad, also an empty nester, or, you know, also just like me, also can't really work full time because of commitments and family in other countries and aging parents and all this sort of thing, like you do. And so she's been working for me ever since, and I couldn't survive without her. And then I, um, then just over a year ago, I was talking to Jane and I said, I want to hand over another part of the business to someone else. I want to hand over all the social media and all that to someone else I'm under paying of the royalties and um, we had somebody who we'd already been using as a freelancer on the team a little bit and she said I think we need to ask Jack and Jack is one of my authors actually I published his first book Perking the Pansies a few years ago and he's in, he has been an expat partner um, except he's, he's back in the UK now <laughs> and he was another one who was just just brilliant and he now runs another huge chunk of the business. So that's how I've coped. I have found two freelancers who are also expat partners, mm -hmm. also want to be mobile, also want expandable, contractable mm -hmm. careers. And they have skills that I need. But the one thing that I think is very important, and I read about it in a book called The E-Myth, 
which I read several years ago. They say that if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, never farm out work that you haven't done yourself. Oh, that is so good. It's so, so, you know, you've been again saying a lot of important things that I really want to highlight. First of all, you know, in order to, in order to be successful, we do have to hustle for a while. But sooner or later, we need to learn, and I'm realizing today myself, and it's not easy to delegate, but we have to learn to, to start building a team and delegating in order to be able to build real successful and sustainable business while we're moving abroad. And you had the chance to meet the right people, but I guess it's also the fact that it also takes talent to know, to, to surround ourselves with the right people. And this is very important. We jumped really fast from starting a business, a portable business, to expanding it. But I would like to go back a little bit on how you started yeah. it step by step. But I guess once we success, we were successful at it, I think you brought up that very important point to make sure that we don't go through the burnout you did by learning how to delegate and, and build a team to expand on all the activities you've been doing. So you you really started a lot of a lot of business ventures and i know that i read in your blog one of your first uh sentences was how how you reacted the first time you went to dubai and saw on your visa that you're not allowed to work so yes. tell us briefly about that and how what was the next step after that yeah um well when i was i have to go back before that um when i was in england I wanted to be a writer, and I was very lucky, and I managed to get some contracts writing books um, in England, and which meant that I could go freelance. So I went freelance, and I started my own business, as I said earlier, when I was 24, and I did it so that I could write the books, which were on word processing programs. And at the same time, I did something else that I think is important for people with a portable career. I... Um, used, I, well, I actually call it exploiting. I exploited myself. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write a book on, let's say, WordStar, which is probably a program so old you've never heard of it, um, if I'm writing a book on WordStar, I'll teach people how to use WordStar as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, st I ran a writing and training company. So I taught people to use word processing programs. And I wrote books on word processing programs. And as I got contracts for about 10 different programs, because there were loads before Word, um, I could then teach about 10 different things <laughs> as well. So um, I was very busy. And then I fell in love with Ian, who had got a job in Dubai. And so we decided to get married, and I decided to go. And right at the very beginning, there I was at the airport, the day after we got married, with my computer, This was in 1987. With my computer, no, too naive to realize you couldn't put a computer on a plane. Now, this is the olden days, and the computers <laughs> were very big. <laughs> I could, they wouldn't take it to put it on a plane. I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So, they, so I ended up having to send it cargo. I was bereft because I'm a workaholic. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anybody in Dubai. I, didn't, I had no idea what to do with my day. I had contracts to fulfill, and I couldn't do it because I had no computer. Then I got this stamp in my passport saying not permitted to work, and I just my world fell apart. I had no computer. I had nothing to do. I didn't know anybody, and I was told I couldn't work. Yep. But I'm one of those people who think, well, I don't think I like this rule. Who says I can't work? Let me ask questions. And I spoke to people and I saw people who were working and I said, how do you do that then? And I discovered, and I discovered something very important. that If you want to be a journalist uh, in many countries, because journalists are freelance and work for many different companies all over the world quite often, they tend to fall under the radar. And you seem to be able to work anywhere as a journalist and just do freelance, you know, an article here, an article there. And um, so I was able to work as a journalist, writing articles. But at that time, I wasn't a, a journalist. I was a book writer. Mm -hmm. And so I went, well, what, ha what had happened was I'd had an idea for an article. My husband had been on a diving holiday and taken some photographs. I didn't even go. I interviewed him. I realized it was a useful sort of article for the What's On magazine in Dubai. I went to see the editor. He said, yes, we'd love it. And I thought, oh, good, would you like some more? So I wrote more travel articles. 
And it was in the same company they had a magazine called Emirates Woman. So I went to the CD editor of Emirates Woman and said, would you like me to write for you? And she said, yes, but you're not very good. Um, I'll tell you what, I think you've got potential. I'll, I'll, you write for me, I'll tell you what to do, I'll shout at you, and you'll learn on the job. Wow. So that's what we did, and she shouted at me, and she shouted at me a lot, and made me start from the beginning again with things, but I learned. And so not only was I able to work as a freelance journalist, legally, but um, I also learned a lot of skills. So that was what happened there. But then the other thing that happened was I discovered that if I wanted to do what I really wanted to do, which was to teach computers, um, I was going to have to find a way around it. And I discovered that if I could find a company to give me a work permit, I could work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was so. What, what actually the stamp in my visa should have, in my passport, should have said was not permitted to take up employment without a visa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I realised that, then I could have done something about it. So I ended up getting a work. I decided that I was a great match for an employment agency. Employment agencies were trying to put um, temporary secretaries and permanent secretaries into companies, and they didn't know how to use word processing programs. So I could teach them to use the word processing program. They could then get the job. The, com- the, the recruitment agency would get the sale, selling the person into the job, and everybody was happy. So I asked this company. I went to see them one day, and I said, if, um, if I give you 20% of my profit, will you give me a work permit? Hmm. And they said yes. Here we go. It's all about being creative and then also seeing things with a different perspective. Having a stamp on a passport does not mean you can't work, actually. Yeah. It just means that under those legal requirements, you cannot work. How did you get from being a journalist to then uh, starting your business? Um, I, well, I started, I started Summertime Publishing in 1995 when we were living in Oman. And when you start a publishing company, all you need to do is come up with a name and see if anybody else has got it and buy a block of ISBN numbers. That's mm-hmm. actually all you need to do. ISBN numbers, you know the numbers on the back of the book that look like the barcode? Okay. That identify the book. And I had an idea for a cookbook, because the first book I ever had published was a cookbook called French Tarts. And when I was in Oman, we had an, I had an idea with a friend to write a cookbook on dates, and we wanted to get it published. And um, by then, I realized that you could make a lot more money if you did it yourself than if you found a publishing company. Because publishing, I had been published, um, I don't know, 13 times by then by publishing companies, mm-hmm. and I knew I was going to get a royalty of 7%. And I thought, I don't want to get a royalty of 7%. If I publish it myself, I get a royalty of 100%. So let's try and do that. So I, we found a partner publisher who became the official umbrella in Oman. But um, I started Summertime Publishing back in 1995, uh, bought a block of ISBN numbers. And so we published dates ourselves. We used local photographers, local printers, wrote all the recipes ourselves, marketed it ourselves. We went into supermarket, um, supermarkets, into shopping centers with trays of ingre- trays of um, tasters from the book. Mm-hmm. And we had, we had um, T-shirts with um, a, taste, um, no, a taste of the Middle East written on them. Mm-hmm. We, um, we, oh, we, we got ourselves in the local paper and on the radio and stuff like that. We did all the um, Christmas bazaars and we sold thousands of books it was actually the most successful book I ever wrote in sales wise because we were there it was a small market and we were something else we were a big fish in a small pond I see so that so that was what we did and so who, who oh, was a, another expat wife her name okay. is Sue Valentine she is a PhD food scientist has also lived in several countries mm-hmm. and is a very good cook right. and right. she's also a very good photographer So between us, we just thought, oh, well, we'll collaborate on this. And that's another thing I learned, that it could be very good to have a partner. Very important, yeah. So first thing is to learn from what I've seen, if I have to summarize so far. I think you insisted on the importance of being curious, creative, and learning. And this is how you started your journey in Dubai. And slowly, 
use your creativity to expand your activity and think, how can I get the chunk of money myself instead of giving it to other people? And you realize you can publish your books yourself. And you just oh. went there and learned how to do it, find out that you basically just need to buy those, uh, I, how do you say? I, ISBN. ISBN. ISBN, it stands for International Standard Book Numbering. Very good. And I mean, if you don't know it, I guess we have to make the research and figure it out. And, and you did it. Mm. And, mm. and slowly you started expanding your business. And what you said then was to make sure also to get a partner and to oh. get help and to hire the right people. And I think you really had this very interesting expansion, traditional expansion of a successful entrepreneur from hustling to slowly, slowly team up with other people to build that success. Yeah. So yeah. how do you do that while you move from a country to another to meet the right people? Well, I think it helps if you understand the importance of making friends and staying friends and staying in touch it's called networking. I didn't know it was called networking back then. I thought it was called being sensible. Um, but I've always, I've always networked. I'm a natural networker. And um, so I've always stayed in touch with people everywhere I've been. I've, I've never dropped contacts. I've always tried to stay in touch. Now, I do need to say that every single thing I've told you up until now, we've got as far as 1995, <laughs> six. Wow. I did before email. You did, sorry? I, before email. Yeah. Before the internet. So I had to harder. keep in touch. It was much harder. Um, and I had to do it through writing letters and staying in touch that way and making phone calls. Um, but I did, and I did stay in touch with people despite moving. That's and I've always believed that, actually, I, I, I only know this now because you only know what you've done after you've done it and look back. You don't know what you're doing at the time. At the time, it's just natural. Um, and then you look back and think, oh, that worked. I'll replicate that. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized I had needed to have a local network and a global network. I need to have people locally who can support me, and I need to have people globally who can support me and mentor me and help to give me referrals and become my clients and that sort of thing. When we got to Norway, which happened after Oman and happened in January 1996, that was the beginning of the email, and that was when I began to realize I could keep in touch via email, and that was an absolute revelation, um, and I started to be able to grow my network then. But by then, I had still not heard the word networking, and I had not heard, the word, heard about expatriate wives. I had never read the books by Robin Pascoe and didn't realize why I was finding it so difficult living overseas. So it was, and but it was while I was in Norway, and actually, I I used to say it. We left Oman, and I threw my flip flops and my business cards in a skip on the way to the airport, <laughs> and that was it, the end. And then I got to um, I got to Norway. It was cold. It was raining. We hadn't got any money. It was horrible. I really detested it. I couldn't find any work. There were no English language newspapers. I didn't want to start a business. I didn't want to speak the language. I was very grumpy. This was my worst, my posting from hell. It was just awful. After sunshine and being able to do what I wanted in the Middle East, I went to big feeling. I had my wings clipped and it was really horrid. So I started to run writer's circles, which I, well, actually I'd done that in Oman and Dubai as well, but my writer's circle became my lifeline and is still my lifeline. I decided I'd start a writer's circle to meet people like me. And then I discovered that by running a writer's circle, which I do for free, I would find people who wanted me to teach them to write. And then I was able to teach writing for cash from my home. So that was how I survived. And um, that's, uh, but it was while I was there that I, I went to my first ever, into my first ever networking group, a professional business networking group. I never thought of myself as a professional, but I went to a group and at the very first meeting, somebody came up to me and said, asked me what I did and I told them and she said, gee, I think she was American, gee, I'd love you to be a speaker. What an amazing story. And I had never done any speaking before and I was completely terrified. And I, she said, you've got a portable career. Have I? I didn't know that. Anyway, so I ended up being a speaker at a meeting and everybody loved it. And it was after that I thought, oh, my goodness, career in your suitcase. What a great title. 
I'm going to write a book. Here we go. And so I decided I would write a book called Career in Your Suitcase, and I would run a workshop called Career in Your Suitcase. And we left Norway in 97, in June 97, and just before we left in June 97, I ran my first Career in Your Suitcase workshop. And by 1998, I started running the workshops at conferences, and I ran them it's at the Woman on the Move conference in Paris in March 1998, and then I ran it at the Win Conference in uh, Milan in um, 1999. And then that was it. Then I did started marketing my business by going to conferences, meeting people at the conferences who could help me. But as I was a journalist as well, I was able to write a lot of articles um, on the people I met at the conference. And it was at the first Win Conference in 1999 that I met a woman, a Canadian called Donna Messer, and heard my first ever presentation on networking. Mm. And I thought, that's, that's why I've got it right, because I'm a networker. So according, so to, you, according to you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but according to sorry. you, your secret is the networking, the secret yeah. of a successful uh, portable career? Yeah, I think it's, it's many things. Networking is one of them. Okay. Asking, is an, asking for help is another. Yeah. Um, exploiting your talents is another. Very good. So one is networking, second asking for help, and three exploring your talents. So can you? Well, there's another one there as well, which finding your passion is another very important one. You have to find out what it is you love to do, because how else are you going to survive with moving from country to country, losing your clients, having to start again, being anonymous again, having to ask questions again, being lost again? How can you cope with that if you don't do something you love? Exactly. That's very important. I think without the passion, we would lose the motivation very fast. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. so find your first, find your passion. Yeah. And that's a very important message. In fact, it's the very first chapter in Career in Your Suitcase, which is now in its fourth edition, that finding your passion is absolutely at the beginning. You've got to find your passion. You've got to assess your skills and find out what it is you can do. You've got to find out what the market wants. Funnily enough, you've got to find out what the market wants. You can't just do what you want to do. There might not be a need for it. So you, you, you have, and then the market changes. Yep. And then certain things don't work anymore. Um, and so, so you have to change. You have to move with the times. You have to start and suddenly do social media. And I get these authors who come to me and say, I really want to publish my book and I know everybody will love it. But no, I'm not writing a blog. No, I'm not going on Facebook. No, I'm not having a Twitter account. <laughs> oh, well, they're not going to sell any. Yeah. I think it's very important to adapt, not only to the time, because things evolve, but also to the country, if we're yeah. trying to make a local business too. It's it's quite, yeah, I think you brought up very important points, is that not only you have to, you know, discover your talent and build up on it, learn, but also offer what the market needs and adapt yeah. to it. And that's something you've been doing really amazingly. And I guess this is what makes you a serial entrepreneur, maybe not by choice, by, by adaptability. You just adapt, yeah. adapt, adapt your offer, and then it makes you have all these companies um, around you. Yeah, yeah, you have to. So, yeah, Career in Your Suitcase became my thing for many years. I was writing and speaking about it, and I found that incredibly helpful. Um, I think everybody who runs a business needs to learn how to write. They need to learn how to write articles, and they need to learn to write how, how to write blogs. I've written a Teach Yourself to Write Articles course, which is available on Amazon for, I don't know, not very much, £15 or something, called Definite Articles, How to Write About Your Life Overseas. And if you learn how to write an article, you can write about it, and you can put it on one of these. There are so many websites out there that want content. And you can start to really get your name out there, get yourself known by writing about what it is you do. And that is how I've done most of my marketing. I very rarely pay for advertisements, and anyway, they don't work. I have marketed myself by networking and by by writing articles, yeah. by blogging. And what we articles. call the guest posting. And I think that is yeah, yeah. very important, what you oh. just brought up. I'm going to share with you my own experience here. I started a podcast show because... I thought that I would never be able to write and I thought that it would be the great way to escape writing. <laughs> and I realized there's no way to escape and it's very important. The writing part, I've never wrote as much as since I started this podcast. 
<laughs> and mm-hmm. that's that's I really like that you brought up that. And Nomad Nation, I would like you really to like embrace everything Joe is saying here because there are so many great tips. And and I do believe that instead of paying, you know, for our marketing for advertisement, there's nothing better than offering free resource and and expert partners are full of resources and stories to tell and we just have to put it on paper and people are willing to to distribute it so we should really take advantage of that that's i think an amazing tip that we have to think about when we build a portable career but i wanted to ask you because there's some practical aspects of building a portable business which is where you were mentioning it at the beginning if you remember that it was the first time that you had to establish your company in a different country where you are so how did you manage actually technically administratively to to uh, actually register those companies through through the years uh, well okay i have to be completely honest here i've left these countries when i was in dubai i did I got a work permit by working for somebody else, mm-hmm. so that's what I did there. And when that, when I didn't have that job, I was illegal, but I didn't advertise, and I did it all quietly <laughs> for cash. Um, but these were in the days when nobody paid tax in Dubai, so it wasn't yeah. quite so wicked. When I was in Oman, I didn't earn much money. I was writing dates, and then when the money came in, my bit in summertime publishing was it was a, is a was a publishing company or entity in England but it wasn't actually a business but nobody knew Mm -hmm. Um, I did try and do some another business there and tried to do it legally accidentally didn't do it legally and nearly got deported but that's another story (laughs) Um, when we went to Norway I did not establish my business I was a freelance writer mainly there writing that's when I started to establish myself writing for airline magazines company magazines and things like that And it was all freelance, so it didn't matter where I lived. So people would pay me into my English bank account because I'm English and I have an English bank Mm -hmm. account. Um, But I was living in Norway. I didn't do any work in Norway. I didn't earn any money in Norway. And if I did, it was cash for teaching writing or something. But I didn't try. I didn't get any business from Norway. So I didn't establish my business in Norway. Mm -hmm. Then we went back to England for a bit. So I established my business in England, a normal company in England, which was easy. It was in English. Hooray. And that was easy. Then when we went to the Netherlands, I established my business in the Netherlands for nearly 10 years. And that was not easy, but they had support and help. And I just asked questions and I found another expat doing the same thing and said, what did you do? In fact, I think it was Stephanie Ward who helped me to start with, I think, who you've also talked to. Um, and because uh, I'd, I'd known, I'd met Stephanie through networking before I went to live there. Yeah. So I, I asked people um, and that was what happened there. And then when I came to Malaysia, I decided I'd set it up in England, but that was easy because I'm English. So I just set it up in England again. Very good. Yeah. So So I guess what it means is that we do have to learn to be flexible Mm -hmm. and to be creative. Um, But how did you manage psychologically in terms of your mood and mindset to go through so many transitions without cracking up? (laughs) Um, I'm not telling you I haven't cracked up. (laughs) I did crack up in Dubai um, when I first went there because I didn't have my computer and I was so lonely. I did did crack up until – well, I think one thing that's really helped me is I have a very supportive husband. He's always listened and he's always understood. He's never thought, oh, it's all right for you. You can just go and play tennis and have your nails done because he knows I don't play tennis (laughs) and I don't – and I never used to go to the beauty salon. So – he never said he knew that wasn't me because I'm not sporty. So he he was he was brilliant. In fact, he got me my first job there because he went to the bar after work. He was talking to somebody who said, "Oh, I wish I could find somebody to help me write write some CVs." And he said, "Ah, my wife can write CVs." <laughs> And uh, she telephoned me that evening and she actually was the one who worked at the employment agency and the rest is history. So he found me the first work I had. Could you take us through, for example, the toughest time you had and how you dealt with it? I didn't deal with it very well, but I shall... uh, Dubai, I didn't deal with it very well. I screamed and screamed and yelled and said I wanted to go home. Um, In in Norway, I was very unhappy for the whole time we were there. Um, but I kept myself busy with my writing, the career in your suitcase, 
by being a journalist and teaching writing. It just took me, you know, everybody goes through a, a, the nasty period of culture shock mm. at a different speed. And it's not depending on the person, it's depending on everything, the country, the circumstances, everything else. I probably had the, um, a very a, a dip in Dubai that lasted, I don't know, probably six months. When I was in Norway, I had a dip of, of hating the place for nearly the entire time. But mm. by the last three months, I was loving it and would have been happy to stay. Mm. When I went back to England, that was repatriation. So that was difficult. That was not easy. Uh, we wanted to go away. In Holland, I found it extremely difficult again. Um, because I'm, I, every time I moved, because I've established a business and a support network, I miss the people desperately mm. when I get somewhere else, absolutely desperately. But there were two things I, I did that had really helped me. To, st to start with, every time I was going to a new country, I would, I would subscribe to a training program, a correspondence course that would be waiting for me when I got there. So when I went to Oman, I did a copywriting course. When I went to, um, when I, in Dubai, I did a short story writing course. And uh, I did them with the, one, I did one with the London School of Journalism and one with, I can't remember the name of the thing, the copywriting school or something. And I did something else um, in Norway when I got there. So something that kept me busy once I got there. Um, and that really helped. Um, and then the other thing I did, in I would get out there. I would start exploring and going out. And in Norway, I wrote a book, uh, I wrote an article you can still find online called, it's on the Weekly Telegraph website, and I think it's called Riding the Expat Roller Coaster with My Bicycle or something. Oh, anyway, okay. the word Dutch bike is in the title. And what I did was I got a bicycle. I thought everybody else has bicycles in, in the Netherlands. I'll, um, I'll get a bicycle. And every day I cycled a little bit further. And I went out in a circle and I just cycled a bit further and a bit further and a bit further until it began, it began to feel familiar. Um, so I did that. I always, as I said, I always set up my writer's circle and it's the first thing I do. So I find soulmates. And the other thing I always did, but I haven't done here, and it has made a big difference, is I always started a, a, a women's network. So I started my own women's network when I lived in England. Called, it was called uh, Women Connecting Women. And I was the president, and I ran that for several years so that I could meet people I was interested in. And he became my clients. When I went to the Netherlands, I joined a, a one called Connecting Women, and got on the board immediately and then became the president ultimately as well. Um, and so I did that. I haven't done that in Malaysia because my business isn't established here and I don't want to advertise. Mm. And that has been very, very difficult being, well, it's not so much that I'm under the radar, um, but I'm much more isolated because I don't want to network here. I don't want Malaysian business. I don't want to make any money in Malaysia. Why that? Because my business isn't established here and I don't want to be an ego. Interesting. Okay, great. But you've been bringing up here so important tips. So let me just list them again, because I think we should really remember them. The first thing you said, and I always repeat it with my friends and in, in, uh, in Tandem Nomads, the importance of preparing the field when we move to a country, we're, pre we're move preparing to move to a new country, by planning something to do for our first days, first weeks. And you did plan your trainings. And I think this is what got you, set, you know, um, running up and running from the first days in the new country you came in. And I think that's a great, great tip. The second one you said, explore. You took your bike and went there and explored the city to, to just embrace the place, your, your new home. The third one, I liked you passed on very quickly, but to find soulmates and connect with people. And I think it, in a way it was a transition to say how important it was for you in every country you lived in to build a network and your mm. own women's network to find like-minded people with whom you mm. can share your knowledge, but also mm. do business and help each other and grow. We could, I think we have to plan a part two <laughs> for job because your life is just so impressive and so, so inspiring. Um, is there one last thing you would like to share before we say goodbye? I would like to share that um, 
two things. One is Summertime Publishing specialises in publishing books for expats, Mm -hmm. and we particularly specialise in publishing books for for our expat family, and that's because we've discovered they're the ones that sell most steadily. Um, The other thing I would like to say is that Career in Your Suitcase is coming of age. It has, since September, Colleen Reichwest-Smith, my co-author, and myself, and Jacinta Noonan, who is a very old friend who I've known since before I went to the Netherlands and lives in the Netherlands. The three of us have established the Career in Your Suitcase way, and that is a program that is being rolled out first in the Netherlands, but then worldwide. That is, we're, So we're looking for people who are probably coaches, who are like you in that you understand this world of being um, an expat entrepreneur and who want to teach other expats, expat partners, to have a career in your suitcase in a work in a workshop and support group setting. We've created a workbook, we've created workshops, we've created support groups, and we're creating an international online community as well. And Colleen is running this, and um, we've just rolled it out. I've just run the first series here in Kuala Lumpur. Jacinta ran one in Singapore before she left Singapore. And Colleen has run two or three groups in the Netherlands so that we could get the feedback. And we are going to be launching the program at the Families in Global Transition Conference next month in Amsterdam. Yep. And we're very excited about it um, because we've, we know that Career in Your Suitcase has come of age the information I've given you, you've taken, you've been very receptive to, but it's been a long journey. It's taken a long time for the world to be ready mm-hmm. for people to think, yeah, okay, I'll do social media. Yeah, okay, I can do networking. Yeah, okay, I can have an expandable, contractable, flexible business that moves from country to country. And the reason that people are now saying, okay, I can do it, is because people are now comfortable with computers oh, yeah. and comfortable with the idea of working from home from a laptop. Oh, yeah. And so now people are ready to say, okay, I'll start myself a portable career. And so the Career in Your Suitcase way has been developed to help people do that, not on their own, which we've always, I mean, people, anybody could buy the book for years and learn how to do it on their own. But people like support. People like doing things in a group. This is fantastic. So, so uh, I, w- I think you have a website. I would like Nomad Nation, please check out the website of uh, Career in Your Suitcase. Could you tell me again what's the address of it, Joe? It's co- it's careerinyoursuitcase dot com. Careerinyoursuitcase dot com and Nomad Nation, please check out this website. But also. Yeah. uh, All the other websites of Joe, she has uh, four websites. So the best way to find them all is to go on joeparfit.com. I will put this link and and the links of all the other websites on the show note page of this episode. And basically to summarize, you have Summertime Publishing Company for those who want to write books and publish them. You can Mm -hmm. be there for them. There's the Expat Bookshop where you can find amazing books all about expatriation and all the topics that we're interested in. There's also a career in your suitcase we mentioned. And you also have your personal blog. So very Mm -hmm. active. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I will put all those links. And is there a way to reach you, Joe? Yeah, joe at joeparfit.com. Very good. Perfect. Joe, thank you so much. It was amazing. And I could continue talking with you for hours. Thank you for coming with us. And hopefully we'll have you again on the show. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Great to meet you. And I look forward to seeing you at Families in Global Transition. Great. Me too. To connect with other expert partners from around the world and share great inspiration and tips together, join us on our private Facebook group. Go to facebook.com and join Tandem Nomad Group.